Good morning, and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm Brianna Zamborski, your worship associate. I'm joined in worship leadership by our co-directors of music ministry, Abha and Stephen Deering, RE coordinator, Nico Van Ostrand, and a chalice lighting by Macy Court. We also have technical support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and Zoom greeter, Jane O'Neill. BUC is a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Bloomfield Hills. Even in our virtual format, we are a thriving community with a place for everyone. Social justice is an essential component of our church life. We are a green sanctuary congregation, a designation we earned through our dedication to caring for our planet. We are also a capital W welcoming congregation. Our justice work this year is focused on environmental action, economic inequality, civic engagement, and racial inequality. Our worship services are hosted on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030, and then later posted to our website and our Facebook page. After the service, we invite you to stay for our virtual coffee hour. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We have four announcements this morning. During today's coffee hour, you are invited to a discussion about the Welcome Inn, a Royal Oak Day Center for unhoused individuals, which BUC volunteers have supported for many years. Immediately after service, there will be a brief presentation about the services the Welcome Inn provides and how you can support that work. And then at the start of coffee hour, you can stay in the main meeting room to ask questions or continue to join a breakout room like usual. Second announcement, we will be ending coffee hour at 1145 today so we can start today's session of getting to know Unitarian Universalism at 12 noon. Getting to know you, you is great for newcomers, those considering membership, or anyone interested in learning more about their own beliefs, as well as those of others in this faith and this community. Sponsored by the membership team, this interactive, introspective, informative, and fun set of four non-sequential classes has been adapted from our in-person course to a virtual model this year. To join today's session, you'll use a different Zoom link than the one you're using for this service. That link can be found on our calendar. Third announcement. This Tuesday, the Environmental Action Team presents The Relationship We Need to Survive, Indigenous Wisdom in Today's World. Join us this Tuesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. for a guided discussion about Indigenous people's relationship with plants, not only as our sustainers, but as our oldest mentors who share teachings of generosity, creativity, sustainability, and joy. The Zoom link is on their calendar and in the BUC community Facebook group. The last announcement is from the Religious Education Council. Though it may be impossible to know who enjoyed the process more, those who baked or those who consumed the goods, last Sunday, RE Council members transferred over 50 dozen sweet treats and more than 70 care cards throughout our BUC community. On behalf of the entire RE Council and RE Coordinator Nico, we would like to say thank you. Thank you for baking, crafting, buying, consuming, and donating. You have made our Bake Off fundraiser deliciously successful. On behalf of a consumer, you are welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning or wherever you are, whenever you are watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit and it is good to be together again. And now our service will begin. As we continue to celebrate Black History Month, um, we're, we're gonna play this morning's prelude is uh, uh, by a lesser known African-American composer named Tom Turpin, who was born in Georgia, Savannah, Savannah, Georgia in 1871. Um, to a father who was politically active, um, and unlike Scott Joplin, Turpin's colleague, he didn't struggle as much. 
Um, he was able to, with his brother, manage a theater, a gambling house, etc., and was quite successful, successful financially. Um, uh, Turpin was a large man who um, was so large, they had to put the piano on blocks and he had to play standing up because his belly would get in the way. Um, this piece is called the Harlem Rag. It was published, it's the first piece, first rag published by a person of color, um, written in 1897. Turpin died in St. Louis in 1922. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Missy Court, a member of the high school program here at BUC. Being Unitarian Universalist is all about creating an open and an accepting space for everyone. As we approach the end of Black History Month, it's important we continue to educate ourselves, take action alongside our POC family, not just in this month, but always. Let's keep uplifting Black voices. Let's continue to grow as a community with our principles as our motivation. Thank you. Please join in singing our first hymn this morning, which is Woyaya, a little bit of background about it. It's written this particular version by Isai Marie Barnwell, wonderful black American singer songwriter, member of Sweet Honey in the Rock. Uh, this particular uh, hymn that we now use as our very own originally came from Ghana, uh, from the language of Ga in Western Africa. And the word Woyaya means we are going or we keep going. So it depends on how you want to feel it this morning, but please join in singing Woyaya. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we will get there. Where we are going, but we 
You are beloved <clears throat> and you are welcome here. Whether tears have fallen from your eyes this past week or gleeful laughter has spilled out of your smiling mouth, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you are feeling brave or brokenhearted, defiant or defeated, fearsome or fearful, whether you have stories buried deep inside or stories that have been forced to the edges of comfort. Whether you have made promises, broken promises, or are renewing promises, you are beloved, you are welcome here. Whatever is on your heart, however it is with your soul in this moment, you are beloved and you are welcome here. We come to this space of holiness and humanness, of covenant and connection, of hurt and healing, to be loved, to be welcomed home. Come, let us worship together. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to create a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. The weekly offering serves as an ongoing reminder of this mission. Sharing in this weekly practice of generosity also strengthens the bonds between congregants and our higher purpose. So let there be an offering in support of this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made through our website on Venmo with the username at BUCMI or through a check in the mail. However you choose to give, please do so with a heart of gratitude and for each other. For our offertory song this morning, please join in dancing at home and singing the choruses if you feel like it. You might even be spotlighted for your awesome dance moves and your energy. If you would rather not be spotlighted, now is a good time to turn your camera off. But otherwise, let's have a lot of fun and join in singing, please. The song is by Matisse Yahu, a Jewish American reggae rapper songwriter. Influenced by world music, Jewish culture, and black reggae music, he's written a lot of great stuff, a lot of songs about unity and about the human experience. This is One Day. <laughs> Day this all will change. 
One day we'll all be free and proud to be under the same sun, singing songs of freedom like we are. This part of the service is set aside for reflection and prayer. We begin with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. And for this sharing, we pause the recording. Now to breathe deeply into a spirit of meditation or prayer. And I offer you these words from the Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, current president of Star King School for the Ministry. In this moment of worship, we call to mind those times of failure and regret common to all of us. We, re we remember first, in silence, those times when we have failed to do all that we meant to do, or through our actions, failed to be all we were meant to be. We now recall our moments of integrity those times we have lived into our deepest values and acted as the human beings we always dreamed of being. We choose at this moment to lay down the burden of our shortcomings and grasp the courage to begin anew. Together, we affirm our capacity for goodness and grace, for freedom and purpose and joy. We are not trapped in our past, but freed by creation to live and grow today. With gratitude, we say, blessed be and amen. Our reading today is a slightly modified article uh, for language to make it more accessible for all ages. Say you're sorry. This is what we tell our kids when they grab someone's toy, hit their sibling, or do many other undesirable things they do before they've learned to respect other people's possessions or bodies. But that's often where the conversation ends with little, if any, discussion of what happened, why it was hurtful, how to address the pain they caused, or what they can do better next time. These perfunctory sorries, especially when said like this, sorry, do nothing to address the situation or behavior. And yet they remain the standard apology that children use into adulthood. 
that's a problem, particularly the into adulthood part. Just look at recent public apologies from famous and powerful people like Harvey Weinstein, a Hollywood big shot who committed repeated acts of harassment and assault. Some grownups still haven't learned to respect other people's bodies or possessions. These grownups say sorry, but usually only to gain the benefits of apologizing, like being forgiven or getting to move on. They aren't really sorry, only sorry they got caught. We have good intentions in making our kids say sorry. We're trying to teach them how to live in society, how to have empathy, how to heal friendships. We're trying to teach them how to gain the true benefits of an apology, but it doesn't work without true feelings behind it. To get to those true feelings of remorse, or feeling bad about hurting someone, you need to accept that you made a mistake. Yuck, this feels bad. For one thing, we might be afraid of getting in trouble, but the more powerful fear sometimes is what we feel inside. We might feel ashamed. When we feel ashamed, we often try to minimize the damage. It wasn't that bad or shift the blame, maybe they, they caused it to happen, or even say the other person deserved it. This is because we can't deal with that yucky feeling inside. How do parents or caregivers help ease this tension? First, focus on the act, not the person. What they did was bad or wrong. They are not bad. It doesn't mean we love them any less or that they are any less lovable. Also remind them that they are human and humans make mistakes. Showing them compassion will help them give it to themselves in these moments in the future. And parents, they learn from watching you. So next time you eat someone else's doggy bag from the refrigerator, you know what to do. In place of a homily this morning, I want to share a story. And this story was told to me by Amy Peterson Derrick, who first heard it from a UU minister from Michigan. It's a true story about a family, a parent and a child named Sam and a really bad day. But this story isn't just about Sam and their mom. It is also a story about how we live our UU faith every day and about how we continue to weave the story of our faith in all we do, even when we fall short. So this day, a few years ago, hadn't started out too badly for Sam. Sam had gotten out of bed and prepared for school just like any other day. It started with a stretch and brushing teeth, getting dressed in a favorite cozy outfit. Sam packed a lunch, ate breakfast, and kissed their mom goodbye before heading out the door to school. But once Sam got to school, things started going wrong. First, it was one small thing, and then it was another, and another, and another, until pretty soon Sam felt sad and angry. And as sometimes happens when you are feeling overwhelmed, Sam found they were making choices that were not helping the day get any better. In fact, some of these choices got Sam into trouble. Has that ever happened to you? By the end of the day, Sam didn't feel any less sad or angry or overwhelmed, especially not when the teacher handed Sam a letter to take home to give to mom. Sam took the letter and shoved it into their backpack, crumpling it up, hoping nobody else saw what had happened. On the short walk home from school, Sam's mind started racing. What am I going to tell my mom? What is mom going to say? Is she going to be angry or disappointed? I wish this day had never happened, thought Sam. This day just felt awful. Sam arrived at the doorstep and slowly walked into the house, plopped down at the kitchen table where Sam was greeted by their mom. How was your day? Sam's mom asked. Fine, said Sam softly. Just fine, 
Did anything interesting happen today? Asked mom. No, nothing, shouted Sam. I don't want to talk about it, okay? Sam's mom put a hand on Sam's shoulder. What happened? Is everything okay? Sam didn't say a word. Sam's mom took a deep breath and asked, mom for, asked Sam for their backpack. She reached in and found the crumpled up letter. Sam looked down at the table, not wanting to see mom's face as she read the note. Sam felt angry. Sam felt embarrassed. Sam felt like crying. Sam, said their mom gently, I can see that you are pretty upset right now. Do you need a few minutes before we talk about this? Sam nodded. That's okay. I think I might need a few minutes too, said mom. Why don't we each take some time to relax a little before we chat? Let's meet back here when we are both ready to bring our best selves back to the table. They both agreed that this was a good idea, so Sam took a deep breath and nodded their head. I love you, said Sam's mom, and I'll be right here. As Sam walked up the stairs to their bedroom, they noticed the pit in their stomach had already started to go away. And after a while, Sam felt ready to talk about it. When Sam came back into the kitchen, mom was already sitting at the table and had set out two teacups. What are those for? asked Sam. Well, said Sam's mom, I find that sometimes when I have had a hard day or had, a, had to learn a hard lesson, it helps me to have a hot cup of tea. It helps me find my calm center when things around me don't feel so calm. I thought you might like to try a cup of tea too. Sam nodded their head. Sam liked the idea of sharing a cup of tea with mom. Then Sam had an idea. I'll be right back, they said. A moment later, Sam arrived back at the table with something in their hand. What is this? asked Sam's mom. It's my chalice. It helps me remember to listen and learn and to try to be my best self. It reminds me of love. Mom smiled and said, that's a great idea. I think I need that reminder too. Would you like to say any special words before we light the chalice? Sam thought about it a little, then said the words that they remembered learning in church. Come into the circle of love and friendship. Come into the community of justice and goodness. Come and you shall know peace and joy. Sam and their mom agreed that from then on, they would light a chalice and share a cup of tea anytime they needed help learning a hard new lesson or needed to have a tough conversation. And so they did. Now, I don't know Sam or their mom in real life, but I've had tough conversations before and I know that they are not fun. So for a moment with me, think of a time that you had a tough conversation of some kind. And where do you feel that tension or discomfort in your body? It's not a nice feeling. Now think of a time when you, like Sam, made some choices that made your bad day worse and worse. Maybe you, like Sam, you yelled at someone you love. And afterwards, when you realized you hurt someone else, what does that feel like? In your body. It's not a nice feeling. And maybe like Sam's mom or Sam's friends at school, you've been on the receiving end of something hurtful before. What does that feel like in your body? It's not a nice feeling. For those of us who like me grew up Catholic, for example, the word confession is loaded. I think it's loaded for Unitarian Universalists as well because of that complicated history, but also because we don't really like feeling uncomfortable. Many UUs come to our faith because it challenges us intellectually and offers an analysis of the world that we don't find in many other places. And perhaps because, at least in part, of that desire for wonderful, amazing ideas that live in the head and not the heart, this practice of confession fell out of Unitarian Universalist tradition. 
In a country too that relies on a punitive justice system, the word confession has negative connotations as well. If someone confesses to a crime, they're plucked from society and ostracized from their circles, sent to prison, detached from their community. And this in some fashion is assumed to rectify a harm. In today's story, Sam's mom didn't ask what happened so she could get a confession out of Sam and punish them for their crime. She asked that, hoping that Sam would confess so the two of them together could figure out a way forward. This is closer to a restorative justice model where confession is necessary to healing. Confession is naming the harm. Sam might say, I had a bad day at school. I stomped my feet and ripped my assignment. And when you asked me about it, I yelled at you. And from that confession comes that difficult conversation and the healing. Sam caused an ouch. And by naming that, they opened a conversation with their mom to find out what they can do to make it right, or maybe what changes they need to make to their behavior, or even to the family's covenant. But without that confession, pretending that a harm didn't occur does not help the one harmed. It deepens schisms within a community or a family, and often it has a way of quietly eating away at the person who caused harm, finding weird ways to leak out in ways that don't always make sense. Let's circle back to our little meditation earlier. Those three feelings of having a difficult conversation, of causing harm, and of being harmed, they're all different feelings. It is not fun to confess and begin that restorative process of talking it out and changing our actions, but neither is it the same as being harmed. I don't know that this is necessarily a case for bringing back confession. Maybe it's just some food for thought, a way of analyzing punitive, punitive and restorative justice in our own circles. What I do know is that for Sam and their mom, taking a moment, lighting their chalice, and drinking a warm cup of tea set the stage for exactly what they needed, a confession, a difficult conversation, and a new way forward in love. May it be so. Will you please join and, and stand if you're willing and able for our final hymn for this morning's service? We're going to be singing When Our Heart Is In a Holy Place. <laughs> When a heart is in a holy place, when a 
Sources of courage and compassion, sources of reason and radiance. In these days of so much uncertainty, may we choose honesty over comfort, love over complacency, and truth over convenience. May it be so. May we make it so. May we go in peace. <laughs> Morning, everyone. We're now going to have a short presentation about the Welcome In by Annis Pratt. Annis, you're able to unmute, so you can go ahead. Yeah. Hi, guys. Lovely service. Um, as some of you know, the well, we, the BUC has been involved with the Welcome In, which is the only uh, warming shelter, daytime warming shelter in South Oakland County, uh, and we've been involved with them for many years. This year, as you can imagine, uh, it's very hard for the homeless. Um, the operation is still going on at Star Presbyterian Church in Royal Oak. Uh, our numbers are very much reduced. Everybody is social distanced. And uh, I think there are 15 to 20 people there now. Um, and they are getting their hot meal and their clothing and able to use computers and things like that as always. Um, this is a very needy population, different from the South, uh, South Oakland shelter in the degree of mental illness and chronic homelessness that we encounter. So these folks are very needy of us, and they have loved the BUCers for many years. Um, this year, we have ke uh, kept up our financial co contributions to uh, to them and because they have needed purchases, uh, we have bought clothing, uh, paper plates and serving goods for lunches and we've kept up their computers uh, in the keeping them supplied with ink cartridges. And then just this last week, we've had to supply them with uh, N95 masks. So I would like to ask everybody if you possibly can to contribute to that fund, which you will find on the BUC website, if you go there, you will find the welcome in and a provision for sending in a contribution there. Anybody have any questions? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start coffee hour now. And uh, if anybody would like to ask some more questions of Annis um, mm -hmm. about the welcome in, you can stay in the main room and um, Annis will be glad to talk to you about that. Uh, and the, the way to donate to the Welcome In is to go to our website on the homepage. Uh, the the uh, Donate to BUC button takes you to our online giving platform. And there is a drop down in that uh, in the platform to donate to the Welcome In, just like we have in the past with uh, that's how you paid for your bake sale treats and that's how you donated mm -hmm. to adopt a mm -hmm. family. There'll be a drop down for Welcome In there.